Well, we're going to turn to Daniel chapter 4, our passage for this morning. As we do so, I've got a confession to make. Um, this probably seems quite out of character, but it's true. I've spent most of the last year ignoring the warning signs. That's that little sticker up in the top corner of my windscreen. It says that the car is well overdue for a service, and I've been ignoring it. Uh, Normally, I'm just that organised kind of guy where 200k before it's going to turn over to the magic number, I've called up Lee, and uh, I'm booked in, and I will be there that week. And you know what this last year has been like? I just haven't been bothered. It was the last thing that I wanted to think about. I know that it's no good. I'm not very mechanically minded, but I can think already. Probably the oil is not very good at this point. Filters will start to clog. Um, Who knows what state the brakes are in. They stopped the last time I put my foot on them. Who knows what could go wrong? And yet... When I get there and I pull the keys out and put them in the ignition, it starts every time. Uh, And nothing bad has happened yet. So what could possibly go wrong? It's so easy to treat some part of our life like that, isn't it? It's, It's not the way that it should be, but it works at the minute. And our spiritual lives are often one of those parts we overlook. We know something needs to happen in our relationship with God. There's a way that we're supposed to be growing or changing. We've got to actually sort that out. Oh, It might be that we don't have something you could actually call a relationship with God at all. Maybe there's a Bible verse or two that we like. There's something about Jesus that's attractive to us. We can always pray when we see the need for it. But there's guilt, shame that we shouldn't ignore, but we do. It seems, though, that things are all right, that things are okay. We might even feel moved sometimes at Easter and Christmas and and when we hear about Jesus. our, Our hearts are stirred, but we haven't actually done something about it. But let's be honest, we all know what 2020 was like and we've got a lot on at the minute. So we can sort it out sometime, can't we? It might not be ideal, but surely nothing bad is going to happen, is it? I mean, it's just like my car. When something does go wrong, though, it will be too late. There is no insurance that's going to fix it in retrospect. There's no uh, way that we can go back in time spiritually and sort out our neglect of our spiritual lives, of our relationship with, with Jesus. And though we don't actually... Uh, uh, the, the thought that we don't have to worry about God, that, that neglect is actually a form of pride, thinking, look, God's out there, I should do something about it, but I don't really need to. It is pride. It's saying, I'm okay on my own. And yet the Bible tells us that pride goes before destruction. We heard, as Rob read from Second Peter chapter 3, God has judged humanity before at the flood. And just because it doesn't seem like that is happening now, it doesn't mean we will always be safe. Now, it's easy to see the danger in others, though, isn't it? You you drive past a a neighbour's place and the lawn is that high and you can go, ah, I know what part of their life they're neglecting. Or you hear a, a car rattle down the road in front of you and you go, oh, yes, I know what they're neglecting. Well, can we see the neglect in ourselves? Often we can't. And that's why God gives us Daniel chapter 4, so that we can see in the life of Nebuchadnezzar what this looks like. 
This great king, he sees the signs, but ignores the warnings. And so he is humbled by God's judgment. What should we learn from that? And what should we do because of it? Those are the, the big questions we're asking today. What should we learn from this and what should we do about it? So come with me in, in Daniel chapter 4 as we see, first of all, uh, that we should behold great signs in verses 1 to 18. We need to see the wonderful things that God has done for you and for me. And that's one of the wonderful things about this Easter time, isn't it? That it's everywhere. The reminders of the wonderful things that that God has done for us. If only we will look and see them. Now, the start of this chapter makes us sit up and look, doesn't it? Uh, it's a letter from the pagan king who's been there through the first three chapters, and he's writing to us, uh, to the people of every nation and language who live in all of the earth. And the fact that these words are here in the Bible mean that they're for me and for you. And he tells us that he has seen the amazing things that God has done. He's revealed the meaning of history. He's protected Daniel's friends last time in the blazing furnace. But now in verse 2, he says he wants to tell us about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High has performed, not for those guys, but for me. See, part of our pride is overlooking the wonderful things, the amazing things that God has done. Not only has he made the world, not only does he keep the world going by his powerful world, uh, by his powerful word, but he makes it possible for us to come into the eternal kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar talks about in verse 3. He makes it possible for us not only to be his subjects, but to be his children, to be in his family through the saving and forgiving work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Now just think of the big picture of the Bible story for a a moment, uh, of all of the amazing things that had to be true for that to happen. That when Adam and Eve first sinned, God didn't immediately destroy the world. I would have if it was my world and it went off the rails. Boom. And maybe we start again. But what does he do? No, he promises right then and there in Genesis 3.15, a saviour who will crush Satan's head. And how does he do that? By coming into the world himself in the person of his eternal son. And we confess it in the Apostles' Creed, don't we? Supernaturally conceived, thoroughly tempted, perfectly obedient, totally committed to die for all who trust in him. Maybe we've just heard it too many times, but we should be amazed by the wonderful things that God has done. And not only all of that, but that Christ rose again to give eternal life for all who come to him. So when we repent, when we trust in Jesus, we have a story that we can share, just like Nebuchadnezzar does. Uh, We have something to say about the amazing things God has done for us. Uh, Shouldn't we talk about it? See, our other option is to do what Nebuchadnezzar started to do as he, he rewinds the tape in verse 4. He, he was resting content in the life that he had built. You see that? I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. Well, wouldn't you be? That life was good. But then God sends him another one of those dreams in verse 5 that terrifies him. God has revealed the meaning of dreams to him before through Daniel back in chapter 2. But notice, again, he prefers to call on the magicians and astrologers in verse 7. And it was when they couldn't help that, surprise, surprise, Daniel comes in in verse 8 and the king decides to tell him the dream as well. See, Nebuchadnezzar knew 
that he would get the truth from Daniel. He tells us here, uh, the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I, I know that he's in touch with the, the spiritual world and can give me the truth. So why did he not just call for Daniel to start with? He knew where he would get the truth, but he didn't want to hear it. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you know what the truth is. You're just not sure you want to hear it. Well, you probably haven't come with a dream today that you need interpreted. But you have come seeing the great signs that God has done, that he has sent Jesus to be the saviour, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So what do these great signs, these amazing things God has done, what do they mean? Well, all of God's great signs have the same message. And it's the second thing that we see here in verses 19 to 27. Receive God's warnings. That's what the signs are about. See, uh, the, the king, as he relates the dream to Daniel, uh, he causes some concern. In verse 19, Daniel is, is greatly perplexed. He's terrified by the meaning. And the king tries to minimise it. Oh, look, it can't be that bad, surely. But Daniel knows how serious God's warnings are. Are we prepared to admit to ourselves how serious sin is? Are we willing to tell other people the bad news and the good news? Do we actually love them the way that Daniel loved his boss, Nebuchadnezzar? That we look at those who don't know what the signs mean. They don't know what Christ's life means. They don't know what his sacrifice on the cross or his resurrection means. And do we love them enough to tell them? Saying to the the Thursday morning Bible study group uh, this week, uh, people have, have done the stats and they see the number of people professing to be Christians falling off like this. But the encouraging statistic is that across the population, four out of 10, 40% are willing to have a conversation about Jesus if we're willing to have one with them. You've got nearly a 50-50 chance that people actually want to hear what you're going to say and are not going to slam the door in your face. As the king tells Daniel this dream, Some of the facts are very clear, aren't they? There's a very important person. Notice in verse 16, it stops being about it, the tree, and it's about him. Let his mind be changed. Well, that can't be a tree, can it, unless you're watching Lord of the Rings. The question is, who is the tree? Who is this figure who stands over all of the others in the world and and gives them all that they need? Well, in verse 22, we're told, your majesty, you are that tree. See, God's warning to Nebuchadnezzar is the same warning for for us as well. Give up your sovereignty. Stop thinking that you are the one in charge of your life. Humble yourself before God, as verses 24 and 25 say. Uh, Daniel urges the king, acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Now, we can sit back and think of the rulers of the world and go, yeah, they really do need to pay some attention to God. But we have our own little kingdoms, don't we, as we've seen in the last few weeks. Sometimes they're just as big as our bedroom or the TV remote. But do we acknowledge that the king who reigns in heaven is the king of our lives, the one who's given us everything we have, that all that we have is because he is in charge and in control. We need to humble ourselves. 
what's also clear in the king's dream is that there is time. See, with my car, I don't know when it's going to go wrong. But Nebuchadnezzar is being told there is time. The stump will remain in the ground. And so Daniel urges the king in verse 27, change now before it's too late. Now, renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then uh, that then your prosperity will continue. And it's the same for us. Jesus comes promising God's salvation to all who believe. Those famous verses in John three sixteen tell us that. But he also comes warning of the condemnation that comes to everyone who doesn't receive his salvation. John chapter 3 continues, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So change So repent, so turn from your sin, receive God's mercy. And if you're one of the people who have done that, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, you've turned from your sin and received his mercy, do you have a tender heart to those who haven't yet? Does it show? Could someone tell by how we spend our time as individuals? Could they tell by the things that we do as a church that we care for the lost? That our mission is to reach out to them and proclaim Jesus to them so that they will be saved. When do we do that? See, God has shown his wondrous signs by sending Jesus to save his people. Do we hear the warning? Do we bring the warning to others? And what will happen if we ignore the warning? Well, then God will do what what he promises to do. He will do what we refuse to do. He will humble us. And so in verses 28 to 33, we're told, humble your pride. See, knowing what Easter is about is not enough to save us. Knowing that God sent a saviour is not enough. Hearing the warning is not enough. We must receive his life by faith. We must come to him in repentance. So don't make the mistake Nebuchadnezzar makes here. He waits. He does what I did with with my car. He waits 12 months, we're told, in verse 29. And you know what? Same thing. Nothing bad happened. He should have been fine by now. Those things that God said never really caught up with him, did they? It's the same today. We hear God's warnings. We think, well, when's that ever going to happen? The world just keeps on going the way it always has. We mistake God's patience for apathy. What a Dreadfully dangerous mistake to make. God's patience is not apathy, as as Rob read to us. God does care about our sin. His patience is meant to lead us to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9 Maybe Nebuchadnezzar spent those first 12 months being pretty careful. I reckon I would have. Oh, better not not step out of line because that thunderbolt's coming. But time passes and he gets lax. And one day he's up on the roof of his royal palace surveying the city, Babylon, the great capital. Uh, He'd rebuilt dozens of its temples. Uh, He'd uh, built up the fortifications, the walls of the city. He'd extended the palace to include one of the seven wonders of the world, the hanging gardens. There's lots to be proud of. Would have made a great episode of Grand Design. And that was exactly the problem, wasn't it? He was proud. I've done all this. Aren't I amazing? 
is basically what he says here. And notice the words are still on his lips when God's word falls from heaven, as God himself speaks. You're not the king until you acknowledge the real king. God judged him. God took away his sanity, took away his kingdom. For the period of time God had planned for him until all of God's promises and purposes for him were complete. And so Nebuchadnezzar would admit that the Lord makes and removes kings just as he wishes. We should expect that. We should expect God's judgment on our pride, on our ruling our little kingdom, because pride comes before destruction. The good news is, in Nebuchadnezzar's case, God's judgment isn't the end. And when God's judgment falls on us in this life, there is still the opportunity to repent. I wonder how low God has brought you. If he humbles us, what should we do? We should praise the Most High God. That's verses 34 to 37. It's the only right way to respond when God shows his signs, when he gives us his warnings, when he humbles us, to acknowledge that God reigns and that's a good thing. Nebuchadnezzar shows us what real repentance looks like, doesn't it? He spent a long time eating grass with the animals, away from people and far from his right mind, as verses 33 and 34 tell us. But it changes, doesn't it? It would have been great reading for the Israelites if that was the end of the story and you could just fade out with the laugh track going, oh, look at that pagan king running around with the, with the cattle. But what changes? He acknowledges in verse 34 God's supremacy. He looked up to heaven. He honoured God in verse 35. He admitted that God is the king of heaven. Verse 37, that everything he does is right. All his ways are just. And so no one gets to tell God off. Verse 35 said. That's really the starting point in any relationship with God, isn't it? That he shows us He is right, and we are wrong. Have you ever prayed anything like verse 37? Have you come to that point where you just have to say, God, what you do is right, your ways are just, and you can bring me down and anyone else you want? If you haven't prayed that, this is the time to do it. Don't wait for God to take you down. If you've prayed like that, if you've been brought as low as you can get and you've turned to the Lord and said, you are right, my ways are wrong and I trust in you for forgiveness, then are you living with Jesus as your king? Does he rule over your time is he the one who determines what happens with your talents with the treasure you gather here on earth could anyone tell that you follow the most high god the king of heaven whose ways are right nebuchadnezzar recognizes that god is king do we show that He admits his own humility too in verse 35. He he confessed he deserved to be brought low. Wonder if God has brought you down. He usually does that to bring you up again. And the way up is to cry out for forgiveness. Jesus promises in John 6, all those the Father gives me will come to me. 
Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away, however low they've got to, I might add. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. That's how Jesus brings us up from however low we've gone. As we look up to heaven, to the one that heaven has sent to us, and he will raise us up at the last day. There's another word of hope here too in verse 36. That as well as that eternal hope, sometimes God even reverses his own judgments here on earth, that when we break our lives, when we create a mess of it and we sow the wind and reap the whirlwind, sometimes God puts it all back together. The cracks might still show, but his grace restores what our sin has broken. When Nebuchadnezzar admits that God is the king over everyone, including himself, what does God do? Well, he gives him his mind back, his sanity is restored and he is restored to the throne and he becomes even greater than before. It doesn't always happen like that. And sometimes we live with the consequences of our sin for a long time, but God is gracious. That's the main thing that we should take away from this. We've heard God's warnings against pride, but remember James chapter 4, verse 6. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Why does God show us his great signs? Because he is gracious. He shows us how to be saved. Why does God give us his warnings? Because he is gracious. He doesn't want us to be condemned. Why does God humble us? Because he is gracious, so that we will turn to him and be raised up by him. Why should we praise God? Because he is gracious, because everything he does is right. See, God not only commands us to be humble, he himself became humble for you and me. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. What happened because Christ humbled himself? Being made, being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself even more by being, uh, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, not you or me. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and one day will in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself to die. Why? So that proud sinners like you and me who believe in him should not perish, should not be destroyed, should not come under God's eternal judgment as our pride deserves, but would have eternal life. That's how the gospel humbles us, brothers and sisters. It tells us we are not the kings in our lives. We're not the kings at our jobs. We're not the kings and queens of our families. We're not the king or queen of anything. It tells us rival kings will be humbled before the king of heaven. But the the gospel exalts us in Christ as well. It promises when we abandon our kingdoms, we need not fear God's judgment. That all who repent and believe in Christ share his glorious victory over sin and death and are given his eternal life as a gift. So what should we do? What does the gospel call us to do about this? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God 
so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Let us come to him in prayer then. Let's pray. Our mighty God, we acknowledge that you are the Lord of all. And yet we have set up our own kingdoms. You are the king of heaven and the most high God, and yet we pretend that we have made ourselves, that we are in charge, that our will is what should be done on earth, if not in heaven. Our Father, we thank you for the mighty signs that you have shown us in the Lord Jesus Christ in sending him to be the serpent crusher, the one who atones for the sin of all who trust in him, the life-giving spirit who created the world and now gives life to all who turn in repentance and faith. We thank you for declaring him to be the son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. And so we ask that we would heed his warnings and humble ourselves and praise him in our words and in our lives, that our family and friends and neighbours would do the same. Humble us, our God, where we reign in our lives. Help us to submit ourselves under your mighty hand, trusting that you will at the proper time exalt us and lift us up with the Lord Jesus. And so in the meanwhile, may we cast our cares and anxieties on him, knowing that you care for us. Our God, we ask it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.